there will be some cupcake decorating, uh, time for just to enjoy, and, and obviously uh, a reminder of what is true love and how has that been shown to us uh, as a people. And so uh, a little bit different than the typical Valentine's message. This is not about uh, boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, or even, um, even our families and our love. It is a love that has come to us uh, from a much higher place, and uh, that is uh, from God specifically in Christ Jesus, and so we wanted to share that with you, and then just enjoy the meal and the, and the fun time together, and, and obviously have some sugar, so uh, that's part of Valentine's as well, so uh, right, after the, right after the service in the Family Center, hope that you can um, attend in that. I also wanted to remind us that tomorrow, uh, Monday night at 12, will be the Lighthouse Dinner, uh, again, if you're unfamiliar with that, and I, I was reminded this week that sometimes if there's some folks here that don't really know what the Lighthouse is and what this dinner is. The Lighthouse is our collegiate ministry uh, building that we have uh, right across from Alp Stadium uh, in Cape Girardeau. It's, it's kind of right there in the same uh, little spots where Soul Restaurant is or Mary Jane's Barbecue Restaurant is. It's, it's right there beside those. Uh, it is a, a storefront building that has... Uh, is, is the Missouri Baptist Convention. It's our, it's our place, but uh, we have a ministry there, a collegiate ministry that takes place on Monday nights. Uh, they host a free dinner for college students. Um, and uh, the majority of those who come and take advantage uh, tend to be the international students that come to, uh, to SEMO. And so it is uh, the entire world that shows up for a meal on Monday nights uh, at the Lighthouse. And so uh, churches from our association rotate, take turns, uh, we'll go and provide the meal. And, uh, and so if that's all that you can do, then, then that is okay. If, if you would like to take it one step further, and, and once you're able to get a plate, sit down and talk with some of these students to find out what country they came from, maybe a little bit of their background, they'll do the same with you. And, and, uh, and just that we can uh, show them uh, just some, a little bit of, the, the, of God's love uh, in that setting as well. I know that, that you, many of you are aware of uh, no Reese Hammond. He is the director of our collegiate ministries there at the Lighthouse. He does a phenomenal job with these students. Uh, he also uh, does um, an amazing job with uh, sharing the gospel with them, uh, having uh, several of them have come to know the Lord over the last few years, uh, seeing them grow in their relationship, and then several of them, when they are finished with their college career, they head back to their their, their nation now as a changed uh, believer. Uh, and so it is literally taking the gospel uh, to the nations. And so if you want to come and be a part of that, and if your part is scooping up whatever that is and putting it on their plate with a smile, uh, then you can do that and know that it's a much bigger thing uh, than just feeding uh, a meal for an evening. So that's tomorrow night. Uh, get, a, get a hold of Patty Dickerson or Ellen Schaefer uh, on the times and those things which you can do to help with that. I also wanted to remind everyone that tonight will be our normal schedule. Uh, 5 o'clock in here, Gary will be leading with uh, MU, and then 6 o'clock will be in uh, the uh, Family Center, and so hopefully you can come and be a part of that. Let me read to you from Colossians chapter 2 this morning. Verses 6 and 7 simply say that, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding, in Thanksgiving. But this morning, where have we, where have we come from? I mean, I don't know what your week has been like. Um, but you know what? We're here now. And God's led us through what, whatever you're dealing with. Maybe it's not completely done yet, but yet you're still able to be here. Uh, and, 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 and you know that the Lord is with us throughout the remainder of whatever uh, this day and the week that He is uh, setting us up for will, will be with us in all of those things. And that even though today I, I know there are many that are waiting with anticipation of who will win the big game, right? But listen, somebody will win, somebody will lose, right? That's the way that it always is. You know, I, I mean, I know I've got a few hundred places. I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I don't either. Listen, I wouldn't even know who was in the Super Bowl if it hadn't been for the fact that the news keeps showing Taylor Swift, right? I wouldn't even know. Um, but all of that said, it doesn't matter to me who wins as long as there's, you know, Cheese dip and uh, chips, I'm good. I don't care. <laughs> but but with that, listen, the, the week will go on. Life continues, doesn't it? And then there's issues that are much greater and, and bigger for us to understand that God has uh, works prepared for us that we would trust that all of His will will take place, that this life is a chance to, to glorify Him, 
to show him to others because our eternity, if we are in Christ, is secure. And so as you receive Christ, that with that hope, that anticipation of I, I, I get to be in eternity with God, so then live your life like that. Like, like it's, there's hope, there's security. Instead of wondering around what's going wrong and how do I change this? No, listen, as you receive the Lord Jesus, then walk in him, rooted and built up, abounding in thanksgiving. Because every day that we have, no matter what the challenge may be, is one that he's brought to us that we can be reminded that he is in control. That he is, he does have us eternally. And that we are secure in his hands. I hope that encourages you this morning. And I hope, I hope you've come to, to worship our Lord. Let's, uh, let's pray together as we begin. God, we thank you for another chance to be here. To be reminded to know that, that our salvation is from you alone. And that it is secure in your hands. That you have completed and accomplished all things necessary that we might be justified in the sight of a holy God. That we can trust in you and in you alone. And then, Lord, we have the privilege of living our life as if we know we're saved. As if we are hopeful about the eternal future that we have. Because we understand it's absolute. It is unchanging. It is something that we can hold on to with our hearts because we, uh, we trust and know from your word that you are good and that everything you've done is absolutely complete. God, we thank you for this morning. We pray that you are lifted high. You are worthy of all praise. It is certainly for your glory. It's for our good. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.
Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swell. This next song, It Is Well With My Soul. How can we sing it as well with my soul? It's because of the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that these light, momentary afflictions compare nothing to the eternal glory that we will receive. And so while we may have these afflictions here on earth, we know that there's something far greater in eternity with our Lord and Savior. So that's why we can say and we can sing it as well with my soul. No matter what may be going on in our life, no matter if we're having peaceful times or troubled times, we can sing it as well with my soul. So let's sing this praise to God, it is well with my soul. Oh, 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 oh,
You deserve all the glory. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the hope that you provided for us through your son, Jesus. Open up our hearts right now, Father, to your word. As Pastor Jason comes up and plants your word today, we pray all these things. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. We finally have come to a new chapter. Matthew 13. We will do our best to make it through verse 23 today, taking on the entirety of the parable of the sower. This is a typical, common, ordinary moment in the day of Jesus' life, at this kind of account. Sitting in a boat. So that he can speak to the overwhelming crowd that is pushed in around him. This happened day after day. Everywhere he went, he was met and followed by portions, if not an entire town at a time. Listening to every word that he said. Now, some were listening because they were convinced that he was and is the Messiah. Come to save his people from their sin. That's It's from the angel to Joseph, Matthew chapter 1, if you're wanting to turn back and look at that at some point. Other people very curious about this man who had become a celebrity, a small town son of a carpenter, mighty in power and able to do things that no one else had been able to do. They wanted to hear more. Another group of people would come to hear Jesus. We might call them the entrepreneurs of the crowd, and I don't mean that in a positive sense. These were the folks that wanted to see how Jesus was doing his wonderful, wonderful miracles. And, and they wanted to learn how to do that for themselves. How, how could they get on this Messiah saving the world train and kind of cash in? I mean, they, numbers of people were following Jesus. They saw that there could be an opportunity to live a life that would have been very, very comfortable for them. Still, there were others who were very skeptical. Now, these might have been common men and women who wanted to live a life that was pleasing to God, right? But they noticed that Jesus didn't follow all the rules very well. And so for them to understand that Jesus was a holy man and yet ignored some of their laws seemed to be, well, it was suspicious to them. And so they would come to hear him teach and see what he was saying. And even still, there would have been a group that was dead set against Jesus from the very beginning. He did not match their expectations of what the Messiah would be and therefore wanted to find a way to get his reputation tarnished so that people would drop their interest and he would be left all alone. Now, the story that we read this morning, this parable that Jesus tells today in Matthew 13 is a picture of those kinds of people. In doing so, he fulfills yet another prophecy about Messiah. And if you recall, that's Matthew's aim. To show Jesus as the Messiah, the one come from the line of David, the promised one, the anointed one, the chosen one, the given to man so that man might be saved. To show this, Matthew purposely shows how Jesus' life and actions are the fulfillment of those prophecies. Well, what does that mean for us? (laughs) It means that we have a, a choice to either accept or reject the truth about who Jesus is. Will you... See him today as Messiah. Or will you see him as a a means to live a good life? Will you see him as a burden on people's lives, filling them with nothing but rules and limitations? Or maybe you simply think it is all an absolute lie. Well, let's read Matthew 13 and see what this parable echoes and shows in the hearts of man and how they receive the truth of the word of the gospel. Starting with verse uh, 1, let's read to verse 9. He says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, 
since they had no depths of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. God, I pray this morning that you give ears to us. That you allow us to hear the, the depth of the truth and what Jesus is proclaiming in this passage that still rings true for us today. And that is, he is Messiah. He is Savior. He is Lord. And he is our only hope of eternal salvation. That we might know, Lord, from your word that you are all things to us, our very satisfaction, our purpose, your glory is our joy. Oh Lord, that we would fight against our flesh and stain of sin in our lives, that we might not be so distracted so easily, especially with the circumstances of our world today or the difficulties that we do walk through. Lord, we know that they are there as a result of sin and that we have no power in vanquishing sin ourselves. You alone have that. That you alone came so that you might have your own blood shed so that we might have victory over sin. Oh, certainly not in this day where we still wrestle with disciplining our lives and, and, and continually making choices that, that we die to ourselves, that we would live a life that honors you, but that in eternity, that you alone have paid that price. You alone have fulfilled that debt. You are our, our peacemaker, Lord Jesus. You are the one who has appeased the wrath of God on sin, that we might have life. And Lord, I pray this morning that we might receive that truth with good ears, with open hearts, or that you would help us to understand more and more that this call of the gospel is less about trying to live a good and comfortable life it is more about losing the life that we have so we might take on an eternal one. We thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your long suffering. We thank you for the mercy and the grace that you've given us this morning. It is to the glory of your name. It is for our good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First point this morning simply is to ask the question, is it really about dirt? I mean, he begins by telling this account of a farmer who's gone out to sow seed. And in the manner that he describes this farmer going out, it's not as if he's gotten his tiller out or his plow and torn up the ground and done all of the other preparation work that we might be familiar with. No, he simply goes out to scatter. Now, that's a method that has been used and still is in some times today. And I think maybe when we finally get to the meaning of the parable, if you're unfamiliar with that, this method will be seen more clearly to you and why he scatters everywhere he can find a spot from the side of the road and the stony, rocky sides of the, maybe the walls that were dividing his plot of land from another, but he throws them everywhere he can. And then from that, in this method, you'll see that there were four ways that the seed fell. One, that seed fell along the path. Two, seed fell on rocky soil. Three, seed fell among thorns. And the fourth is seed that fell on good soil. This is less about trying to figure out what type of soil you are. I know you probably heard messages in the past or teachings in the past where you're asked, what type of soil are you? Now, again, it corresponds to the meaning of the parable, but this is more about how the word of truth was received how it was believed or rejected. Jesus taught us from the beginning that the kingdom of God has come. People everywhere should repent and recognize that their salvation was not going to come in the form of a military regime or a newly established kingdom over the world, but would come as a heavenly kingdom, as it would be filled with those who would come from the promise. That's a capital P, the promise. The promise that was made to Abraham long, long ago. Genesis 12, verse 2, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. 
Now, that promise was partially fulfilled in Isaac, that promised son to Abraham. But the promise was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. He was the son of David. He is the one to be called the Christ. Now, this was not about making the kingdom come to earth by accomplishing some number of tasks or appeasing God enough. No, God sent his son Jesus into the world so that the world might be saved through him. How you receive this message is a revealing of what type of soil you might be. The way that you receive this truth is a revealing of what you're truly putting your faith in. The understanding you have about life and all that is around you, the reason for everything in existence, you, in how you receive this truth, shows just what you believe when it comes to man, to sin, and to eternity. So is it really about dirt? No, it is about the veiled gospel that has been revealed in Christ. Let's read on. Now, as we've heard this story of the parable of the sower, let's read on where Jesus' disciples begin to question him about why he is asking or telling these stories. And uh, chapter 13, verse 10, begin with me there. Let's go through verse 17. He says, Then the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak in, to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing They do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed." lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, and and did not see it, and longed to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. This is large for us to take in. This is complicated for us to see. Jesus has his disciples now asking him why. Now, why this need for parables? Now, I I find it kind of significant where they're asking him about parables because this isn't the first parable he's told. He has used them before. But now, whether it's their curiosity has gotten the best of them, they want it to be satisfied, I'm not sure what kind of complete satisfaction they got by the Lord's answer. But nevertheless, he answers in a very straightforward way about why he gives the truth of the kingdom to the people within these earthly stories that have heavenly meanings. I mean, think of it again. He goes back and he answers them. To you has been given the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has will be More will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. This is interesting to me, because then he uses the prophecy of Isaiah in fulfillment in what he's speaking, what he's teaching, how they are receiving this truth. I mean... (laughs) If you remember, this is from Isaiah chapter 6, probably one of the more well-known accounts of the Scripture. It is certainly used over and over again when we are giving a a missions emphasis, sending uh, our missionaries out, not just even to our own nation, but to other uh, nations that they would go and, and give the gospel. I mean, this vision that Isaiah has in chapter 6 is mesmerizing. There are angels flying and singing God's robe, which is to represent his glory, is flowing everywhere, filling the entire temple. Isaiah encounters an angel having his lips touched from a 
a burning hot coal from the altar, and it signifies that his sin has been cleansed. And it leads to the most well-known portion of this chapter, and that is verse 8, which Isaiah says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I'm sure most of you could close your eyes because Isaiah answers, Here am I. Send me. Right? Heard it over and over. And this is given as a commission for our, for our people to go and to share the gospel with a lost and dying world. However, we, we rarely in those missions, conferences, or in those teachings go on and read verses 9 and 10, which says, And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. It was a a message of going and sharing the revealing of God and His good news. It was also a message of judgment. And here Jesus is among this crowd speaking about a farmer sowing seed. And when asked, why? Why why do you speak in these parables? He gives Isaiah's prophecy. I want us to hear what Jesus is saying in this passage. And we may not fully understand it. We may not like it very much in not understanding it completely. But if we are a people that makes statements about how we believe the Bible is true from cover to cover, then we need to be humble enough when it comes to parts of the Bible that we may not be able to fully understand or fully explain completely. And listen, there are portions of that. This is is one for me that I will never say I completely understand how this all takes place. God's ways are higher than our ways. But we need to be humble enough to concede that the Bible is not wrong in how it teaches, how it describes, how it displays, how it magnifies the grace of God and the Lord Jesus. Let me give a bit of an understanding and illustration of what I'm saying. Jesus is saying that some have been given the gift of the kingdom and others have not. Now we can speculate. We can can try to figure out what, what he's trying to say here. He uses the call of Isaiah to elaborate on this. We cannot in this moment try to figure out who this gift is being kept from and why. Because we don't know. Have they been that disobedient? Is there some way of figuring out how they've rejected Jesus already? I mean, we, we are alluded to in the fact of in, in Romans chapter 11, Paul speaks about the last Gentile that would be brought into the fold. And when that takes place, there will be a pouring out of God's spirit among the Jewish people. And there will be a, a revival, if you will, that would, would, would encompass this people. And that many of them would come to know the Lord Jesus. And this is how all Israel will be saved. This is why we recognize that all of the promises of the ancient Israel are promises that are fulfilled in God's people, people of the promise, not just because you're ethnic Jew, but because you've been brought into the fold, you've been adopted, you've been given new life in Christ. You're part of God's family now, from Abraham, the promise of Isaac, all the way through to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is not explaining that. What he does say is that he obviously is the salvation that they are looking for. This this parable was a means by which Jesus was able to take a very deep spiritual truth and convey them so that the ones who had the ability to listen would. They could, and they did. They were able to see the truth that had been veiled for so long now that was revealed in Jesus. Paul speaks often of the mystery now revealed in Jesus Christ. This time before where they were searching for salvation, these prophets that Jesus even says, they longed to see what you see. They longed to hear what you hear, but they never had the opportunity. They spoke God's word. They were looking forward to the Messiah. They never saw him come. You have. Blessed are your ears. Blessed are your eyes that you now see God has come to man that they might be saved. The signs and the wonders and parables We're not given to impress those around Jesus. And Jesus was not showing off 
He was declaring his divinity. He was displaying who he really is and how those who saw and heard received that truth or rejected that truth would lead them to their eternity. No different than us today. How you receive this truth is what dictates where you spend eternity. Do you believe it? Do you trust it? Do you put your own life in his hands? Or do you wait for some other kind of proof as the Pharisees wanted so much? Do do you want more for you? Some kind of bribe, some kind of proof beyond the fact that this world in its existence, as we spoke of in our Sunday school class this morning, how it still hangs in the balance between life and death. And yet it is sustained every day. Not fully understood why. Yet the scriptures do declare because it's in the Lord's hands. Can you put a scientific, mathematical, algorithmic equation to that? No. You can put faith in trusting that what the scriptures have given us have been revealed to us for our good. Now let me read on because Jesus now finishes with the meaning of the parable to those who are listening to him and I think helps us understand all of this and the urgency that we should receive this truth with life today. Start verse 18 with me. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches Choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is for us to understand that the seed that's being sown is the word of God, it is the gospel of truth. It is Christ crucified, buried, and raised again. The kingdom of God had come to man. That is the seed that is being sown. It is truth that is being scattered to and fro everywhere that we might have an opportunity. The farmer, although I don't know what you've been taught in the past, the farmer is not me. And the farmer is not you. Now, I recognize there is a practical application that as we take the word of the truth or the gospel of Jesus, then it would be, as we say, scattering seed or sowing seed. That's a a pragmatic approach, and there's nothing wrong with seeing us as scattering the seed. But in the context of this parable, the farmer who is sowing the seed is Jesus himself, that they might receive the truth that he is the one who is coming and bringing the gospel. We must see and be willing to humbly bow to this truth this morning that your salvation does not simply happen because you chose to believe in Jesus all on your own. Now, let me explain what I'm saying. Because if you were to say that God somehow doesn't help us, that he does not come alongside us, that he does not open our hearts, then you don't quite understand what the scripture gives us when we say, God brings us to the place where we might see him as the truth, as the gospel, and then receive him. Let me give some illustration. John chapter 6, starting with verse 35, says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on that last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Now that's Jesus declaring Himself the bread of life, the gospel, the one who would save. And so the Jews begin to grumble. 
How can he say, I am the bread of life come down from heaven, they said. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Verse 43, Jesus answered them, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on that last day. Now, what about in Acts chapter 16? I read this last Sunday night when we were looking at the beginning of the church at Philippi. In Acts 16, starting with verse 13, it says, And on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. One more, Matthew chapter 11, verses 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And these are just a few verses that show us that we are not alone in our understanding who Jesus is, that God does come alongside and help us, shows us, reveals to us his truthfulness. But now let me just say that we also need to be reminded that within this same scripture, and I mean in totality, not just in those verses, that when we hear the word of God or the gospel of Jesus, we are culpable, we are responsible, we must and we will act on this truth one way or another. We will either receive it or we will reject it. In Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 13, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. 1 John chapter 1, starting with verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Acts chapter 3, starting with verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that, that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. I want you to see this morning that it is the veiled gospel, but it has been revealed in Christ I want you to understand that this is less about what kind of dirt that you are, but it is more about how this, this truth is received. This is being able to see that God drawing you, opening your heart, helping you so that you can truly hear the gospel is what God does to help us. And then we're responsible for how we take this truth and that we respond to it, that we that we act on it, that we do look to Jesus as our only salvation, as our only help. Now, this is not where I want us to debate about the order of salvation or whether we seem to lead on one side or the other concerning the doctrine of election, which I do believe Jesus is speaking about here. We can certainly talk on those things at different times. I'm eager to do so. I will gladly share with you where my... my my certain perspective lands. And it can be good to discuss those things. They, it helps us to go back to the words so that we might see exactly what is being said at certain times. But listen, hear me this morning with all my heart. I think the most profitable thing for us to see this morning is that Jesus is telling us the reality that there is only one gospel, and that is He alone, Christ alone. Trust in Him, come to Him, confess Him, that he is your salvation. It does not matter what else you believe in this life. If you reject Jesus as Lord, you have no salvation. 
And he is urgent in sharing this with these people. He is telling this day after day that they would come to know who he is. This is why the gospel, the seed, has been spread far and wide. That it is spread through every place. We, we might say every nook and cranny. Wherever a seed may fall so that the truth may be able to be scattered. So that all those who are there may hear this truth. His gospel is to be taken every place that we can so that they may share and that they may hear the good news that Jesus saves, that they would hear it and they would respond, that they would call out to God, they would cry out for forgiveness, they would repent of their sinful ways, they would receive the gift of grace offered only by the shed blood of Jesus. Now listen, this morning, in Jesus just simply telling this parable, I want you to understand you've been given the truth of the gospel. How do you receive it? So one last interesting note, though. I know a lot of teachers may jump right to the, to the far end of this parable being explained and talk about the 100-fold or the 60-fold or the 30-fold. And yes, the Bible does speak of blessings that come to us as we live a life of obedience. It certainly gives us enough to where we understand there are rewards in heaven for our lives of faithfulness to the Lord. But to turn this into some sort of now works-oriented competition that you've received Jesus by faith and you've received him by grace alone, but now let's turn it into let's do a whole bunch of stuff so we can get that big reward. We've just now turned Jesus back into a lottery ticket. Don't do that. As far as the 100 and the 60 and the 30, what is the significance of that? I, I think in the context of him telling this story that we could go back and we could say that a farmer in those times, if he was able to reap a crop of tenfold or let's say even twentyfold, that was known as a superior harvest. It was known as a blessing beyond their imagination that they were able to reap a twentyfold harvest. Are you kidding me? God has been certainly good to you. And yet in this listing, the thirtyfold as the least of this, that simply means that the least of those who would come to understand that Jesus is Lord, that He alone is our Sabbath rest, that He alone saves, that He alone is our justification before a God that we might have eternal life, then the least of these will receive something they could never even fathom. That's what that means. It's not a competition this morning. It's a declaration that there is a truth in Jesus Christ and he is calling for all those within the hearing to trust in him. That, there, that this knowledge would fall on good soil. That it would take root. That it would not be seen as a means to a good life. That it certainly would not be seen as a, as a means of a burden of following rules and regulations. And somehow working your own way to heaven. No, that it would be seen as a gift that comes to us and then grows. And is a blessing beyond our comprehension. That we would receive forgiveness and we would receive eternal life, that we would be justified, that all of our sin would be cleansed, and that we might be saved. This is the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus. And I simply ask this morning at the end, come to Jesus and live. Now, I recognize I don't always have a really strong or powerful kind of an altar call to say, come this morning. But this, this passage, it, it yields itself to maybe you've been sitting in this pew as long as I've known you about five years now. And maybe you've heard message after message, which Jesus being our sal salvation, as far as I, I'm able to go back and read any of them, has been in every single one of them. It has been also given that you are to respond to this truth one way or the other. Either you will receive it, you will accept it, or you will reject it and turn your back on it. And I don't know where you are at the moment. Many I've had conversations with, I understand, but not everybody do I know. And, and to simply say that if I was to ask you if you were saved today, and you might give me an answer that contained something like, well, I walked down the aisle some years ago. Maybe you would say, I, I, I prayed a prayer with Brother Daniel. Maybe you would say, Brother Daniel even baptized me in the waters. Those are wonderful things. But I would would probably venture to say that even Brother Daniel would say, but that baptism didn't save you. Praying that prayer, that somehow didn't work a miracle in your life. The fact that you even wanted to say that prayer, I hope would be that you had already recognized Christ is. 
But if you prayed that prayer in some hopes of a good thing happening, or you prayed that prayer in, in this idea and understanding that if I, if I do this good thing and I get baptized, then maybe God will make my life a little bit easier. I'll have less problems. I'll be able to live a, a better life. That, that's not the gospel. Some of you would tell stories about your own coming to Christ moment where it had been shared over and over and over again. And when it came time for the, for the traditional altar call of come forward, you gripped the pew as if you were holding on to a cliff over a 300-foot ravine until one day you couldn't hold on anymore, could you? Oh, it, was like, it was like somebody came behind you and picked you up by the collar and just pulled you all the way up to the front that you might declare Jesus as Lord. Yes, that's what happens. Because we, we respond to the truth of who Jesus is. And so I'm asking this morning, if you are here and that you have placed your salvation on the facts of things that you did instead of what Christ has done for you, then I would ask you to begin to pray right now. Lord, have I confessed you, Lord, of my life? Have I confessed you before men? Have I truly come to you for the forgiveness that I so desperately need? Or am I simply saying, God, help me out in my time of need because I sure don't want anything bad to happen to me? Or maybe you've all along wondered, how could this even possibly be true? And the only way that right now you are contemplating that this is, this is truth is absolute evidence that God has opened your heart that you might hear the gospel. And so I'm simply asking you to respond to this truth this morning. It may be that you need to come forward and confess him, Lord. It may be that you come this morning reminded of the urgency of the gospel call that living your life... With the, with the hope of eternity is not something that you've been doing the last several days, weeks, months, I don't know how long. You've been living your days based on the current circumstance of your home life. You've been living your, your days based on how much the money's been coming in and how much it's been going out or how much everybody's been getting along or maybe not getting along or how easy work has been, filling the gaps with whatever else. I've been living my life concerned more about the things of this earth and not living in hope of absolute eternity that my Jesus has provided for me. And I would say maybe come, pray about that, repent of that. Come and tell the Lord that you are very well aware that you are his and that he is yours and let him fill you with his joy again. Wherever else it may be and may lead you of ending a grudge to, to being able to see the urgency in your own life of just the desire to, to be back in his word. I don't know where it may be. I'm telling you this morning, it can be, cannot be any clearer for our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Jesus is calling us to declare him Lord over all things. So I'm asking you to do that this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for being with us this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the Reality that you have come to us when we certainly didn't deserve you, could not have convinced you on our own good works, could not have coaxed you to come alongside us in what we would call our idea or understanding of obedience, knowing that without you, Lord, we don't even have the ability to, to bless you, to obey you. That in our transgressions we are dead. And yet, full of grace and mercy and the richness of your love, you have made us alive in Christ by your gospel. I pray this morning, if there is one that needs to confess you, Lord, needs to confess you before men, Lord, that you bring them forward to the glory of your name, not caring about their reputation or Resolve in their life, but that they would give you praise by saying, He saved me. If there are others this morning that simply want to come to pray, repenting of whatever it has been in their life, being reminded that you alone are over all things, God, then fill them with your joy and allow them to be able to come express that of their hearts. And God, knowing without a doubt that you will provide for them, whether it's the wisdom they need, the courage they need, the peace that they need, because you alone are all those things. And then, Lord, for us, whatever else that you have 
called us to, to be resolved on, that we would do so knowing it is out of obedience and out of a, of a gracious heart because you are a good and gracious king. Help us this morning as we worship you. And it's in the precious name of you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Stand as we sing a hymn of invitation. And this is your invitation to come as you, as the Lord's leading on your heart. Would you come? Some of you are aware and know them. They've been visiting us and being a part of us for quite some time. And uh, they came to me, I guess it's been a little, maybe a couple weeks ago, and just said, um, we feel like we're home. And they want to come and to be a part of, of our family here at First Baptist Millersville. And so upon meeting with them, they're, they're coming on statement of faith. Uh, and uh, both of them have trusted the Lord in uh, their salvation. They have been baptized. And so um, it is with uh, really a great honor, it was a great, great time of, of just getting to know them and their story uh, and just uh, to be able to present them to you for membership. All those who are members of our church, all those in favor, let it be known by saying amen. 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 We received them today. I, I want you to be able to come uh, at the end of the service, you know, greet them with the right hand of fellowship again. Even if you know them, then, then just welcome them as part of the family. And Lord, we just, uh, we just pray that we can be continued uh, family to them as whatever the the Lord brings us in our future, it is for His glory, it's for our good, and that we get to walk with that, uh, those things together. So, so thankful you all have come. I'll let you go back uh, to be able to have a seat. And uh, for you all just to say, it's good to have you this morning. Again, uh, 5 o'clock, Gary will be here in MU. 6 o'clock, um, uh, we'll be in the Family Center. You, no, no choir practice tonight. Um, and, uh, and so from that, I uh, hope you'll just be able to come and to be a part. So, Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you so much uh, for the blessing of uh, this day. Uh, we thank you for the blessing of your word and the truth that is contained in it. And I ask you, Lord, bring it to our minds. Help us to, to think on it um, throughout our days all the more so that we might just be, be aware of you, to acknowledge you. Um, Lord, that, that, that that alone would help us in times of need to remember that you are Sovereign Savior, uh, that you are good, and that all things, um, Lord, the blessings, the gifts that come from you, the Father of lights above, you are unchanging, and that we truly can trust uh, you. Thank you for that. It is certainly um, for the glory of your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.